Well, everybody, looky here. The next chapter with Charlie is now live on video for the very first time. And you get to be, you get to join the experiment because this is a test that we're going to post the test. So it's going to be, it's going to be whatever it comes out like, it's going to come out like, but we're very excited. This, we're planning on this being our platform uh, beginning 2025, but we will see. Now, for my very first show, live show, is my dear friend, the brilliant, the ever so talented, Caitlin Cogan Domner. And uh, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about a subject that could be controversial, but it's really not because it's, it's so universal. And I, you know, Caitlin, as I was wrestling on how to explain our topic, Caitlin said, well, why don't you say, and she went on with this brilliant ex exposition. And I told her, you know what, Caitlin, you just tell everybody that. So tell us. Tell us what you said, because it was so good. Um, I love this. So, Charlie, you and I are having a great conversation about politics. And you're like, well, I don't know if we want to get political. And I was like, you know what? Let's talk about the nature of social justice. Who's like who is responsible for the poor? So we know that everybody is talking about politics and it's creating division and strife. And we know that that clearly isn't the Jesus way. So what? is an alternative methodology? And can we create a manifesto of love that isn't just this heady, cerebral, spiritual thing in the clouds, but actually has feet on the ground? And we can talk about what does it really mean to love humanity in today's day and age? You know, you just said some magic words that I'm making into the title of our show, a manifestation of love. Mm. Tell me what you mean by that. Yeah, well, I was saying manifesto, but I do believe it has to be manifested in order for it to be worth something. So how can we create an ideology of what it means to have unconditional love for ourselves, for others, to love others as ourself? Uh, that's the nature of that mandate. And then as we have this manifesto, <clears throat> it's very simple, right? Love God, love others as yourself. Like Jesus was really clear that love is really the only thing that we need to be worried about. But I find that my Christian brothers on the right side and my Christian sisters on the left side, like they see this thing very differently. And so what we want to kind of dig into and unpack is what is the nature of love on the ground in Washington, D.C., in our own city councils? What what are we doing uh, that shows the world what love looks like in today's political arena? You know, and I, I so I so agree. You know, I I, I was thinking, and I put that um, I wrote a blog on this subject, my last blog. So that would have been November early. I don't remember what date, uh, but it was titled uh, "It Begins with Me," and and I thought it seemed to me that the election itself incited powerful thoughts about social justice. Mm -hmm. And I figure my friends who are are who lean left or are strongly left feel very strongly th that social justice is being challenged and 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 may be in danger and and um, so today what I want to do is exactly what you said. I don't want to talk about politics because I believe this is personal. This is about Caitlin, it's about Charlie, and it's about everybody listening. It's personal. It's a show about you and me and our responsibility to other people and to creation. And, and I think, you know, even as you mentioned city councils, you know, there's a place for that. There's a role for all that. But what I want to focus on is what is our personal responsibility? Because mm -hmm. I think, you, you, you know, I... I I, I, you know, I am a, am fond of individualism and, and I know that that's not popular with everybody, but individualism with a charismatic heart for other people. And, um, just recently, a couple weekends ago, I attended a 450 person conference put on by Richard Rohr's, the center of action and contemplation, the attendees. And this was by invitation only because they were part of a group that's called the living school. 
uh, were people committed, deeply committed to serving the disenfranchised, as well as learning life-giving habits of a contemplative spiritual mysticism. And so, you know, you really, it's, it, it, it's an integration of the self and society. And so I, I came up with, with three sort of statements. So they're kind of philosophical. You know me, I'm going to get philosophical. Uh, so there's philosophical statements. So these are our, this is, this is my manifesto. Okay, in, in Caitlin language. One, social justice is less a governmental thing than it is a personal responsibility. Two, therefore, social responsibility begins with me. And the beginning with me is not my actions, but my character and my heart. And I think a helpful starting point on personal and social responsibility begins with Jesus' words in the Beatitudes. And he said, this is the kind of character that the person who loves his neighbor would exemplify. And he says, it calls for the kind of character that is to be poor in spirit, to mourn, to be gentle, merciful, pure in heart, and makers of peace as we hunger and thirst to live in a loving relationship with all creation. So I just summed up all eight Beatitudes. But this is, this, I, I love this character of being poor in spirit, you know, this humility that, that I know I need something. I, I know I'm, 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 I'm missing out and, and, and I've got to practice. And, and for mourning, it's for mourning the self in our society. And that's, that's the heart. Mourning is the heart of social justice in my mind. And gentle or humble, merciful, pure in heart, makers of peace. Um, how does that strike you? Yeah, I love that. It's always a good reminder that when you're talking about what is our our mission, the one that had come to me was uh, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly, right? Like this is a, our, our heart's affectation is towards mercy, right? We, we love mercy, we do justice, right? We don't always do mercy. We don't always like this. It's the action, the heart, and then the walk humbly. It's the, and I think that's what you're getting into with the Beatitudes is this proper recognition that we are not always sure of the best way forward. And we're going to do the best what we, we have with where we're at. And we're looking at each circumstances. And that's, for me, this is where I found a place of compassion uh, between the right and the left. There was a great book by um, Ken Wilber called The Theory of Everything. And he had shared that if you think of all of ideology as uh, internal versus external, individual versus communal, and most of the right conservatives tend to focus on individual and internal. So we want to save the world. How do we save the world? We save it one soul at a time, right? Whereas the more, the less conservative, the more liberal, the left side, they focus on the external and the communal. How are, we want to save the world. How are we going to save the world? We're going to do prison reforms and education systems. And uh, we're going to try and level the playing field of the circumstances. And that's how we're going to save the world. But I think what's interesting is that helped me to appreciate that every person is really trying to make the world as good a place as they can for themselves, for their loved ones. They just are starting with completely opposite perspectives on how to do that thing. And so once you can appreciate that the other person's heart is in the right place, they just are, are tackling the same problem from the other end of the rope. It allows you a little bit more compassion and can say, okay, where do we have things in common and how can we work together and collaborate? Uh, because we recognize that all of it is true. It is just a spectrum of where do you want to focus your time, your resources and an attention when you're moving forward. You know, it's almost as if, I hate to even say sides, but both perspectives. Let's mm -hmm. don't do sides because it's a divisive, a divisive noun. 
mm-hmm. um, let's say perspectives, both perspectives are really in harmony with the what. Mm-hmm. That there needs to be something done. There mm-hmm. needs to be something done for the disenfranchised and the poor. It's about the how. The how is the question. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's really difficult. I, I like what you had to say about Ken Wilber. And, and I, I really like that I, that idea. However, both are really required, are they not? Mm-hmm. And, and and both are really very important. One side pays more attention to a focus than the other. But you brought up when we were talking, as long if we could simply understand that we are both searching for the same what, it's a different how, now we have room for dialogue. Yes. Because there's an appreciation for the other side that you're trying I would do something different. Let's see what we can do. Let me let me understand you and and hopefully you could try to understand me and we could come up with some kind of congruence, some kind of some some kind of dialogue. We may not agree on the hows, but we can appreciate that we're both trying to do the same thing. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm looking for is integration, wholeness. How can we balance both perspectives in this work that we're doing? So um, I do a lot of coaching and healing and I've recognized you can just focus on one or the other and it's really challenging. Um, So I've seen people who have changed everything around their life. They got a new job. They married a new partner. They lost the weight but they changed everything external and internally they hadn't done the inner work to align with that new identity. And so inevitably they sabotaged, everything fell apart, or they were just, just as miserable as they were in the old job with the old partner in the old sized clothing. And so I think for me, I've come to realize it has to be both. And if you're just doing the inner work, uh, but you're not testing it in real life, you're probably bypassing. You're probably doing some spiritual bypassing. Um, And if you're just focused on the external, it's not going to be, we won't be able to sustain that level of shift. So it's like when I've seen people just give money to the poor, right? The money just dissipates and it doesn't actually make a positive lasting impact because they still think of themselves as poor, right? And so- I want to kind of balance that if in every dialogue that we're having, if we are going to go in and do education reform, how are we also working at an individual level? How are we incorporating mindfulness techniques and uh, self-love lessons? Like how can we balance the need for the individual needs to recognize that they are valued, that they're loved, that they are powerful, that they are connected to God, however you describe God, whatever that looks like, right? Bringing people back to their own personal center. And then I find that the once they have those inner belief systems, it's a lot easier for them to sustain an external environmental change because they have the identity capacity, the psychological framework with which to sustain that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and, and it is, you know, personal development is individual, individual development, individual growth. A a couple of things come to mind. I think the two biblical references that we use, the Beatitudes from Matthew and the, um, um, walk humbly, do justice. Mm -hmm. No, walk humbly, do justice and love mercy and have mercy. From mm-hmm. Micah, I think that it, I think that's from think Micah. So. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it, it begins in a core in our heart. You know, mm-hmm. it begins with who we are as a person. What is our What is our identity as a person? And and, and if my identity, like you talked about about the people that that make changes in their life with marriages and careers and who knows what all, those are really external only temporary fixes. Now, mm-hmm. 
they can be they can be meaningful fixes like you know you know if you're out of a if you're in a horrible relationship and you find a relationship that's based on love you know that is that's extremely extremely important new jobs i know people that hate their jobs mm-hmm. and just hate it and, and they want to get into a more meaningful and more more empowering job um my wife is a leadership expert she believe me she studies leadership more than anybody i know and she said something she just read was talking about the for it, it was on leadership and the first quality of leadership was a dedication to personal development mm-hmm. but the author or whoever she was talking about i i don't i don't know stated and i thought this was really entrance per, interesting so many personal development or personal growth efforts too often have no metrics by which to measure the growth. Mm. I want to develop, I want to grow. But what does that mean if there are no metrics? What am I growing toward? What am I trying to do? And with social justice, we're trying to grow our heart and our compassion for our in biblical terms, our brothers and sisters who are not as fortunate as we are, who are in circumstances that, that are very difficult to come out of. You know, mm-hmm. inner cities. What is mm-hmm. the answer for inner cities? They're, they're, you know, I know no answer. I know, I know because there are people without hope because they have, they have, they have seen hope and they, you know, they barely, they make less than minimum wage so they can't make a living. So you're, you know, after you do it for a while, you say, why am I even doing this? You know, because yeah. I can't, I can't survive on that. You know, we, we've got, we've got to understand those kind of people and not label them mm-hmm. as, oh, they, they don't want to work hard enough. They don't know, they don't know right. what work hard enough even gets them in, and they don't know direction, you know, they're, they're directionless. And so those are, those, those are areas, areas that I think I could serve is helping giving people strategies, tactics, Mm -hmm. and, 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 but tactics of the heart, strategies of the heart, and that they, and that they have, that's what we do with one group I work with called Higher Ground. We work with giving people hope and helping them find their identity, that they are valuable, and that it's important for them to have a mission, a personal mission of value. Yeah. Uh, and I love this word hope that I'm like eating it up. Cause I do feel like that is really at the core is where does hope come from? Uh, and it's interesting. I was just reading Brene Brown's Atlas of the heart and she says, hope is not a feeling. It's a state. And she said, there's GPA. There's three things that you need for hope. G is a goal. P is a plan. And A is agency. You need to feel like I know where I'm going. I know how I can get there. And I know that I can do it. Right. And so as we're looking at uh, organizing missions, right, is there a goal? Is there a plan? And do they have a sense of confidence that this is possible for them, that there is a possibility of improvement? Because if we don't have that, we have nothing. We will just simply not make any improvement, personal development or external improvements uh, without that sense of hope at the heart of what we're doing. I love that. I am, um, I have discovered taking, I just got into with Richard Rohr's people. They're so into the Enneagram. Mm. And so I, I found out I, I am an Enneagram seven, which ah. is, which is, you know, is it we the enthusiast? are enthusiast, agents of hope, optimist, you know, that I'm an optimist. Now I can be very cynical. Don't think I can't be cynical. You know, I'm a cynical SOB, but that cynicism is light in, it's cynicism light in who I am. I'm not, um, who was it that wrote on cynicism? Was it Schopenhauer? Do you remember? I think maybe Schopenhauer, but I, I read a book on cynicism that that's very popular and, and I mean, very well, you know, it's considered a, a, a major work in philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that is not me. I am always thinking of hope, but mm-hmm. 
But I like that, that you need to have a goal, a plan, an agency. Mm -hmm. But there needs to be, maybe it's the agency. There needs to be, there, what helps is that a guidance and hope, because they're not even sure what to hope for, except for, you know, except for moving above the Maslow's chart of food and shelter and water and warmth and clothing, you know, mm -hmm. move more to significance. Mm -hmm. That I can be, that I can be, we want to belong, you know, you know, our belonging deal, we, we not only desire just to belong, we, de we desire to belong to something that's important, something mm -hmm. that, that's of value to us. And so many people, especially the people we're dealing with, with many people that have just, you know, have within the last five to seven years come across the border and, you know, they don't know how to do a checking account. They don't, I mean, there's so many, you know, so many things to, that are just natural to us that are, they don't even know. And so they're not given opportunities for hope. And, and um, I think that's where we, that's where we can serve is that we can show them, show people without hope that there is, there is hope for you and not just hope there is a true a true opportunity for personal existential ontological goodness that goodness and love yeah i think what i'm feeling is is for me the individual always has to come first like that inner work connecting to whatever is higher, connecting to a sense of self-love, right? It's almost impossible for us to shift our state if we don't have that internal identity change at the heart. But at the same time, if, if we have that internal identity shift, if we feel connected to God and we're loving ourselves, but we aren't then turning around and giving a hand to the person behind us, faith without works is dead, Right. It's this idea of like, yes, we're going to preach the Beatitudes on a hill and we're also going to give them bread, right? Like there's this <laughs> combination that Jesus had of I'm going to give you spiritual food and I'm going to give you physical food because you don't yet understand, like you're not always ready for the spiritual food. So let me like meet you where you at, where you're at, at that level of whatever, wherever you're at on my Maslow's hierarchy, let me meet you there. And let me help you there so you can feel seen, heard, loved, cared for. Your body is taken care of. Your emotions are soothed. Now you actually have the mental capacity to start thinking about the existential, right? What is the nature of God, the universe, and my role in this place, right? But I think that when I look at the disenfranchised groups, we were talking about the disenfranchised right, uh, the disenfranchised poor, uh, looking at terrorist cells in other organizations, in other like countries, that at the heart of it is really this, I don't have hope, right? I can't tell you, I have no reason to believe that the world is going to be better for my children than it is for me. And if, if you don't have that hope that your child's life will be better than your own, yeah, you, there's very little reason to love your brother or work for a community or give uh there's there's no sense of community identity and that belonging right and so it's just how do i get a sense of power and we've seen this like tony robbins has talked about this a lot that boys without power by guns right like if we don't have that internal sense of worthiness that internal sense of agency, that internal sense of love, we're going to start finding horrible, often violent alternatives that give us that sense of just, just dear God, don't let me feel helpless anymore. Like, how can I act out? And so I think it is one of those things, like, how do we very intentionally serve the world? But I'm with you. I don't actually think that it's a government's responsibility to do that work i think it was the church and now it is the individual's responsibility um, or charities or, or charities or, yeah you know the the to me the core of work i, I you know yeah i'm so such an advocate of 
nonprofit charities. Mm. Um, let me give you an example that are two mm. examples that I think I think you know are real life examples that talk about actions that you've been talking about and we've been talking about. And that is the work with two charities that I've been involved in for the last almost 10 years. No, not, yeah, well close, nine years. So, um, and that is one is higher ground and another that, and I'll talk about what we do there. And the other is Wells of Life where we give water to, we've given access to clean water to over a million people in Uganda. Um, and, and that really impacts impacts life. But one of the things we do at higher ground is um, the city of Anaheim, which is a city in Southern California, gave us five acres of a park. They gave us a five acre park with a baseball field and and a soccer area to play soccer. And, and then we built, mm, I can't remember... 10,000 square, yeah, 10,000 square feet of modulars that we do after school care, but we are not after school babysitting. It is not just, okay, let's just take you out and have you play tag and run around. We offer for this is for young kids, for elementary school and some high school, but it's mostly, it's mostly middle school and, um, and lower school. We have classes and we have STEM classes, we have dance classes, we have music classes where you go into these rooms, it's filled with guitars and bongos and all sorts of things that kids can play with. And they learn and they're given, you can do this, you can think differently. You can, you can do, they, 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 in the STEM classes, they have science where they blow shit up and the kids love it. You know, they think this is so cool and they're into science and they've never been introduced to this. They've never been introduced to what we in our middle or middle to upper class society, you know, that's just norm for us and th that you can have hope to do these kinds of things. And we offer family counseling and we'll work with, with families and kids and, you know, and the changes, the life changes are just outstanding. I mean, we're so... It is such an impactful organization that we get volunteers from Chapman University, UCI, Cal State Fullerton, and Cal State Long Beach. We have 80 volunteers per quarter that are interns, 80 interns per quarter to learn more about. They're out there working on a four to one ratio with kids. That's amazing. And, and they, they're a mentor for them. They're a loving mentor because many come from very troubled families, dysfunctional families. Mm -hmm. They have a source of love and, and, and goals and a plan. And now agency, you, you know, we do what we can, but you know, that's a family matter, but we mm -hmm. can give them goals and plans and they feel they have hope for the future. And then, so, so, so that is something, and that is something that's easily for me to personally be involved in. And it's also communal. There's a community of people in higher ground that are just committed to this community, you mm -hmm. know, utterly committed to this community. And then very briefly, I'll tell you Wells of Life, where when we bring water to a community, we, you know, one water well, we have, I don't know, over a thousand water wells. And I can't remember the math. I'm sure it's over a thousand water wells, but they serve about a thousand people per well. Okay. And this keeps moms, they, this keeps the worker bees, which are moms and girls, really, in, yeah. in this African culture, it's in mm -hmm. Uganda, the moms and girls fetch the water. Right. And they have to go get unclean water, which they have diarrhea, dysentery, cholera. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's so unhealthy that they miss school. Right. Um, they, they can't do chores around the house and when we put a water well in their community now we have we've doubled and tripled the number of girls that attend school regularly yeah. we we've worked with we've worked on issues like like menstrual hygiene 
mm-hmm. and how and and the big thing we help the girls because we we actually supply um, um, re reusable you know what washable menstrual pads mm-hmm. that they can that they can have that and we also educate the boys not to diss the girls because that's a that's a big thing boys always make fun of girls as they're going through this and so. So these are these are changing lives. These are hope. You know, you're not just you know you're giving them physical hope with water, but you're helping them mentally, emotionally, and yeah. and their career. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of thing I think we can do as individuals that the government just doesn't do a good job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really challenging at the biggest levels to affect anything effectively right i really feel like i my my philosophy of politics is always drive the power down to the smallest common denominator um and so how can we push that power so that state shouldn't have any uh or the federal government shouldn't have any power that the states can handle the state shouldn't have any power that the cities can handle the city shouldn't have any power that the family can handle right the family shouldn't that the individual right it all comes down if we actually believe that democracy is going to be an effective form of government, it requires a trust of the individual. It absolutely is built on the individual can and should and has the ability to have a voice in the government. So that's where I think for us, it's like we have to get down to that individual level. We have to get to the person I trust an individual to be able to change their circumstances. If I assume that everybody needs external help, all I'm doing is disempowering that person further. So this is where it's such a hard balance of like, how do I provide the resources? How do I take personal responsibility to affect social justice? And how do I create opportunities for others to step into their power, to take their own version of personal responsibility to utilize these resources and to change their life. Because at the end of the day, change, in my opinion, is always a from the inside out uh, conversation that we need to have. And so just figuring out how do we provide those, those resources and encouragement. And I think the thing you said is we, we supply them with love, right? And I think that's kind of where our conversation started. And I think it's where it ends up is this is the core word for everything. It's love. How do we communicate love for ourselves, for our brother, as if they are ourself? Um, and this is how we show our love of God, you know? Yeah. And, and, and yeah. as a, um, as a contemplative on the mystical path, uh, love is a huge, is a huge, aspect of my journey and 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 you know one of my heroes in theology is Bonaventure St Bonaventure from the from the 13th century you know late late 1200s <laughs> and he convinced me a number of different he gave me gave me ideas that I that I had not really thought thought out as much as he had and that I think so much of what we're talking about is the nature of God. And, mm-hmm. and, and we can't look at God as an external entity, as this clockmaker that puts things together and lets it work. This God is already intimate, and this God is love, and that is where we get it. You know, there is a source... We are created. We are DNA. And in, in the Big Bang, you know, I, I I have this wacky theology that the Big Bang, the Big Bang, because I believe everything. And I know you do not know where I'm going because you've heard me say this before, but that everything begins with love, mm-hmm. and everything begins, and the sexual encounter is intended to be one of love, of mm-hmm. tremendous intimacy and the big bang oh i'm gonna put it so crashly the (laughs) big bang bingo is 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 a trinitarian Mm. orgasm now i know Mm. that's terrible to put you know (laughs) that you would say that 
I don't mean that, but what it is is it means that that it it is it is fertilizing, and the womb is the cosmos. Mm-hmm. The cosmos is the womb into which God spreads divine DNA, and that divine DNA is love, and we are all everything in the planet, everything in the cosmos, every star, every rock, every you know, every tree, everything we have in the cosmos is love. And, and if we have that, and so Bonaventure said, before God is anything, God is good. Mm-hmm. And good is the noun, and the way God demonstrates good, his, his or its, or her, because I, you know, I, 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 I don't believe that God is any gender. I believe God is gender full, not genderless. God is full of all genders. And that, and that, God expresses her love, her her goodness through love. Yeah, love is the verb. Yeah. So, so with that, let me ask you now. Let me get personal with you. Mm-hmm. What kinds of things do you do, or do you think you can do that contribute? I want to give people ideas of what we can physically do to contribute to raising up the poor and disenfranchised? Mm. What can we do? I love this. Um, So I feel like there's so many different ways that we can tackle it, but you asked for the personal. So I start with the personal. Um, I think it starts with be the change you want to see in the world, right? So making sure that if you want to calm anger, spread peace, right? Not anger. If you want hope, don't spread like dissatisfaction and animosity, right? Like, so make sure that you are fully aligned emotionally, that you're not acting from a place of, I have to, I should, it's uh, my duty or responsibility. I feel like if, if we're being motivated by anything other than love, then we, the state that we create from is the state that we will create. So bringing yourself Mm. back to an internal state of love, peace, joy, and faith, gratitude, uh, appreciation, right? Bring yourself to that space and then look for opportunities, right? Awareness is the first step. What is possible? There are plenty of ways that you can support the world. What speaks to your soul? So for example, Michael and I support three schools in Pakistan, um, a pastor reached out to Michael. Michael sent him some money. I was like, are you kidding me? We're sending somebody on the internet money. But it, <laughs> it was it was during COVID and they their village was starving because Christians are second class citizens. And so he just sent some money. We fed some people. That worked well. We sent them a little bit more. We said, how can we get involved? Should we, because we're entrepreneurs, like, can we teach you guys business? And they're like, actually what we need are schools. If we can teach our kids English, they can break the cycle of poverty. Fantastic. Let's start some schools. And so we're like, well, tell us how much it's going to cost. We're thinking like $10,000. And they came back and they're like, well, I know it's a lot, but with $750, we could start a school. And for $500 a month, we could make sure every kid has a clothes, shoes, a lunch, books, and an education for like 50 kids. $500 for 50 kids. That's like $10 per kid per month. Like we're like, done, let's do it. And so just, we were, we happened to be willing. We had our eyes open, an opportunity arrived. We tested it. We got good fruit from it. And so we fertilized that plant with more love and water, right? So some, it, I think it kind of just depends on what does God lay on your heart? Who are the people that you are most passionate about serving, looking for opportunities, being open, uh, for what's there and doing whatever you can, right? Jesus reminds us with the Pharisees giving a lot of money and the woman with two pennies, like it's not the amount that you can give, it's the heart from which you give it. And so starting with whatever you have, wherever you're at, maybe it's just keeping granola bars in your car and handing them out to homeless people as you see them on the side of the road instead of just avoiding looking at them, right? It's it's how do we do what we can with where we're at and what we have, you know? That's beautiful. I like that. Let's, um, we're getting near closing time. And um, 
I think that's a song by Tom Waits. Uh, <laughs> um, um, you know, and I want to, closing time is a hell of a time to redirect or go in a different direction, or, but I have to. Because, because, you know, we both live in middle to upper middle class communities. Mm -hmm. So we don't have in our communities directly that we come in contact with on a regular basis, poor and disenfranchised people. Now, when I, when I go to my inner cities in Anaheim, I, 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 I come in con much more contact with, with people then. So I have opportunities, but that's not where my life is. Mm -hmm. Do you know, Caitlin, well, I know you know, that so many people in our community are poor and have a boatload of money. You know, they, they are, they're, they're not poor in spirit, they're broken in spirit. Mm -hmm. Or they have no hope, or they just, they have, they have these, you know, we, we, we wrestle with these self-identity issues, especially as you move up the chart, you know, as you're moving to self-realization. There comes a point where you, you know, you don't feel you're worthy or you don't feel you're capable. And those are people I also feel a strong, a strong drive to serve. Mm -hmm. It is the people that don't feel good about themselves and, and, and it's not based on finances. Mm -hmm. It's based on brokenness of heart and people have poor marriages, and poor jobs, and just poor self-esteem. You know, those, there are the broken people, the mm -hmm. poor people in our community that need as much help as others because their life is so tormented. And I know, you know, no, I'm sure people disagree, say, well, as long as they have money, they're okay. Well, you know, that's until you know people with a lot of money and you know their life is pretty shitty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I think what you were saying is it doesn't matter who looks like they have money or don't, they all need hope and healing. <laughs> is that where you were heading with that? <laughs> well, you know what that, that is, I think you just picked the closing words. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It's a matter of hope and love. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Did I quote you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, we all need healing, right? We regardless, all need healing. Regardless of our external circumstances, it all starts with that heart of hope, love, and healing our relationship with the divine. And ourselves. And ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it all begins with me and you and our listeners. Mm -hmm. God help us all, literally. We need that. Caitlin, you are the coolest. I think everybody can see why we're friends. We just, we, we swim in the same pond. And um, you're a delight to have on the show. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much, Charlie. I love our conversations and yeah, getting a safe space to talk about hard things is, it's a beautiful gift that you give your thank speakers you. and your listeners. So thank you. Thank you. And I also want to thank um, uh, our, everybody that's tuned into the show and tuned into next chapter with Charlie. And as usual, until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.